Uh, welcome to the pod, and uh, we have had some some bad semifinal games through the years. There's a 10-year stretch of the four-team playoff. There have been some bad ones. Today, it went out with a bang. Doesn't get a whole lot better than this. Michigan, 27. Alabama, 20. Overtime. Washington, 37. Texas, 31. With... What did Texas have? Five or six passes into the end zone at the end of the game? Uh, three, I think, actually. Three? They, yeah. they had one yeah. earlier, though. They had one early. Yeah, uh, right. At least right. four. I mean, yeah. Unbelievable. Cardiac. Uh, the cardiologists of Seattle were happy with this game. <laughs> uh, Washington was almost going to blow it in unbelievable fashion. And Texas was going to come back. Michigan dominated the first half. Looked like they were going to blow it. Special teams, missed field goals, buff, muffed punts, you name it. Anyway, just absolute battles from all four teams. We tip our hat to all of them because they gave us an, an, an incredible night of uh, college football. It is 3.54 a.m., and we're talking ball. Mm. <laughs> Thank you, Rose are, Bowl. Yeah. In the yeah. sunset. Yeah. We're going to get to that because uh, that yeah. is – We are. I'm sorry for the people that are listening to this that didn't get to watch Texas Washington because no one can tell the freaking Rose Bowl that they have to start their semifinal at 3 p.m. Mm-hmm. The games are too good to get into it now, but we will get into it. I have thoughts, Pat. I have thoughts, <laughs> as you like to say. <laughs> we thought you would. Thought you would. It's terrible. Yeah. Are we here for the customers or some BS? No. BS. Just arrogance. Anyway. Let's go to the game because it was the sunset was spectacular. Game was even better. I, I'll just leave the floor open. I'll start with you, Pat. Thoughts? Um, first game, Michigan, Michigan, Alabama. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, really a, a an impressive, gritty kind of regrouping when on the brink for Michigan. You know, they were down twenty to thirteen. Nothing was going their way. Um. You know, it just looked like Alabama was slowly squeezing them out, as Alabama has been known to do. And then they rally, you know, and they put together the tying drive and get it into overtime. And and then, obviously, Blake Corum uh, wins it in in OT. But um, just very impressed. As, As you said, like Michigan had to be sick at halftime that they were only winning by three. They should have been winning by 10, 14, whatever. Uh, and you know, you let Alabama hang around. It's got to be the worst feeling in the world. Nick Saban's on the other sideline, and they're still in the game. And uh, they, but they they regroup. They rallied. JJ McCarthy made some big plays. His receivers stopped dropping passes, uh, and they got it done. You know, so um, I, I I really thought that was going to end badly for Michigan for a good part of the second half, and instead they found a way to win. Yeah, it, um, I just look at it from uh, kind of the 30,000-foot view. Um, I, what this mean, the the win means for um, for Michigan in the Big Ten, honestly, given the track record with the SEC, Michigan's track record with the SEC, Michigan Big Ten's track record with the SEC, Michigan's track record with bowl games, I uh, saw a stat. That uh, Jim Harbaugh and Bo Schembechler were like, uh, or Bo Bo Schembechler was like, you know, two and eight maybe in in, uh, Rose Bowls. Does that sound right? Yeah. And then in in, in Harbaugh is one and six in bowl games. It just, it's just huge to do it and to do it against Alabama, right? Do it against the SEC champion, do it against Nick Saban. My goodness. Um, Just huge for that program and huge huge for that league and uh and you knock out the big bad sec but like as far as the game on the field and i got well i got to watch about you know two quarters of it just in and out of travel and in uh making the rounds of our game in in new orleans but um uh the uh i i just i saw the alabama come back you know and and take that 2013 lead and i just figured well that's it right like that, that, that you, nick saban and alabama don't blow that very often late um but it it shows a lot um 
about about Michigan and in uh, JJ McCarthy. You know, JJ McCarthy outplayed Jalen Milrow for sure, right? Um, when you look at Alabama and its season, it really came comes down to like kind of consistent quarterback play, um, right? And that's it, it, it. Felt like what what kind of bit them here, um, right? When you when you look at some of the numbers and and, and stuff, and then they couldn't couldn't block for him either. Right, I think he was sacked five or six times, uh, Jalen Milrow. So, yeah, I mean, Michigan's like front. Michigan's lines are just incredible. The O line, the D line. I mean, they're just huge. And uh, and this championship matchup, which I'm sure you know, we'll get to later. But I'm excited about the matchup of these lines, and it's another big matchup for the Joe Moore Award winning offensive line in in Washington against another really good defensive front. I was talking to someone at Alabama few days ago and i he said what'd you think i said well you got better you have more talent but i'm telling you michigan they get first downs like 10 yards and one inch they just <laughs> they just yeah. find ways they're just uh, they uh, they have to be infuriating to play against you're like we got them they scored a td with 442 left in the second quarter to take a 13-7 lead and alabama made a huge Comes down, got a field goal, 13-10. From that point on, it was punt, three and out, or six six plays, 21 yards, punt. Three plays, two yards, punt. Three plays, one yard, punt. Then they get a turnover. They go five plays, 20 yards. They miss a field goal. Yeah. They were going nowhere. Right. They were going nowhere. And the play that will be etched in Michigan lore was the fourth and two. 319 left in the game. They're on their own 33 yard line. It's fourth and two. They have three timeouts. And kicking the ball is the standard operating procedure. Michigan called an extremely aggressive game again. Sharon Moore calls aggressive football games. Sometimes too much today, but he, he goes for it. They went for it. Beautiful play call to Blake Corum gets 27 yards. And all of a sudden, it was like the whole game swung. They hadn't done yep. anything in over a half of football. And I don't know. It looked like Al everything changed. Michigan thought they could win. Alabama, maybe not. And they get down there. They tie it. And then they get to overtime. They score pretty easily. And then they hold. We get to the final play if you want. It always seems to get a lot of attention, even though there's mm -hmm. a million other plays in front of it. But. To Ross's point, I think it is a historic victory for Michigan. They don't win this game. This I, right to say this is the greatest victory in Michigan football history. It's it's not out of the it's not out of the debate. I, I, I don't know what happened in the forties and stuff, but like some Benny some Ooster State, Bond might disagree with you. Yeah, <laughs> I don't care about back. I mean, no offense to anyone back then, you know, but I don't care. In modern college football, this might have been their greatest victory. They certainly have a few over Ohio State, but other than that, they get the Washington State one in 97 yeah. in the Rose Bowl to win a share of the title. But to go and and be finally beat the SEC, you know, when they beat Ohio State, it was like they won three games in one because mm -hmm. they could kind of, at least to a degree, put the Connor Stallions thing aside to a degree. But if they had lost that game, Ohio State would have been able to go, oh, we never lost to you. Yeah. They won that game. So what do you want now? We didn't have Harbaugh. We didn't have Connor. We didn't have anything. This feels a little like they won the last two playoff games, too. Like, okay, we're not just this this phony from the Midwest that shows up. We're serious. We can win a national title. So I thought that was a there was there was just a lot to this game for, for Michigan. I, I think I said it on the pod the first time I saw Michigan in person. It was a Penn State game. Um I think I came on here and said, boy, like this is it, it, it just uh, they they like pound you to death, block you to death, tackle you to death. Right. It's like this was such a that kind of game, that kind of score. Um, and they did it again. And I remember saying on the pod like that this team in, in uh, I think at the time I said Georgia. Right. The, like these two teams are um, are are going to meet in their head and shoulders above everybody else. And obviously Georgia dropped the game against Alabama, but uh, Michigan just continues to uh, win like kind of the old school way. 
Um, it, it's just not super fireworks and all this stuff. I mean, they don't throw for like 500 yards. They're not a Washington, right? I mean, it's a, it's a, it's an older kind of brand of football that's honestly refreshing in a way, right? Um, and uh, it, it was just evident to me seeing them in person. I remember just recall that Penn State game, seeing them in person, like uh, wow, like you know, this is this is the team. Yeah, and I, I um, again, yes. I, I mean, they used their formula to win, but I mean, I thought, I thought they'd blown it. Frankly, like when they got the turnover, when Milrow fumbled, and they got the ball around midfield and did nothing with it and missed the field goal, I was like, I, they're done. They they missed their window of of opportunity, but they weren't done. They you know found a way, and as Dan said, the big fourth and two, the decision to go, and then to execute it the way they did, and. And they just made some very, very big plays at the end. And then, yeah, defensively, they they kicked Alabama's offensive line's ass, um, which really isn't that surprising because Alabama's offensive line hadn't been very good this year by by Alabama standards. And Milrow holds the ball, and so he is sackable and has been sacked a lot. <clears throat> but Michigan, I thought, did a great job of dialing up pressures and and finding ways to to come at Milrow and either confuse him or just, or to get him to the ground both of which uh they did many times six sacks um uh, the i think the the line play if you were looking at it and saying who's going to get six sacks i would have thought it was Al- Alabama instead they had one so Michigan was winning both sides i think Dallas Turner only had three tackles they kind of took him out of the game to a degree the final play, the offensive line just blew up that that right side of the line right into Milrow. You know, Alabama was not sharp. No. Obviously, that snap was low. There were snapping problems all over. Yeah. One thing I think that happens in these games is no one's played for a month. Mm-hmm. You know, and there's a lot of little stuff. I don't know if that'll go away some. In God, the Alabama snapping. Stout Man, and, snap and I, I saw the I saw the center uh, declined to speak to reporters after the game, and uh, there was a great quote uh, from uh, uh, one of the Michigan defensive players about <laughs> it was like mid game, I guess, and he was trying to have a conversation with the <laughs> Alabama center about how crappy the snaps were, <laughs> and he was like asking him, "What's going on, dude?" Like, and the, the, I think the, Al, Al, the uh, Michigan defensive player was like, I wasn't trying to hate on him. I wasn't talking trash. I was like, yo, what's the problem? Like, you're sucking. What's right. going on? And he's like, he didn't want to say anything to me. He didn't want to, he didn't want to engage. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't blame him. That would not be a conversation I would want to have at that point either. Yeah, yeah. And, and that goes back to the last play. Right, yeah, the yeah. snapping. Yes. There was an RPO Snaps that's been broken down, down a lot. Yeah, the the snap is low, and so Milro can't read the RPO quick enough. Which apparently the there was the the pass option was the swing route, and the run option was what he took, which was his mm-hmm. was basically a draw. And uh, the the swing route appeared to be open. Open certainly there was leverage there uh, in Alabama's favor, but he he didn't have time because the snap was so bad. Yeah. yeah, and that uh, it was an interesting quote from Saban about that, where you know there were back to back timeouts before that play, and he, mm. said, he said we had three different plays called, and he said the first one we had the right look, but Michigan called a timeout and changed out of the look mm. and took it away, and so then Alabama called the timeout and changed it up again, and then bad snap and kablooey. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I, he had to from- run. Go ahead. Go, go, go ahead, Dan. No, no, I, go I wanted ahead. to clarify. Uh, this is from Mike Rodak of 24-7. It was a Michigan defensive tackle, Chris Jenkins, on uh, McLaughlin's snaps. I was like, what happened, bro? I was genuinely, like, confused. I wasn't even trying to talk trash. I was just like, what's going on? He ain't say nothing. Good stuff. Great stuff. Yeah, so but, yeah, Mc- McLaughlin did not speak to reporters afterward. And, uh <sighs> God, it that it was just uh, pretty horrific. And, and Nick Saban, you know, I mean, the little things, right? The little details. Um, that's how, uh, outside from collecting talent, uh, that's how Nick Saban's teams have won is doing all the little things right, and not making mistakes. And boy, yeah. that was a that was a big little that thing that that pre snap uh, penalties. 
Mm. Right. Um, there was a lot of non-Alabama stuff, but that final play, which of course is just the final play. I mean, there's they had plenty yeah. of chances to score, but yeah, that the snap was off. Michigan's um, Josiah Stewart, one of their famed Massachusetts three stars, right? Absolutely <laughs> blew up the Alabama line. That didn't help. I don't know if that our that pass option was going to work. People were like, "Oh, yeah. if he'd done that." Mikey Sanistro was there, another Massachusetts three star. Big something. assumption, yeah, yeah. I mean, he was there to like bat it down, or yeah. you were going to have to loft it. I mean, it it was a little bit like it's not like there was a dude wide open in the end zone. Like a lot was going to have to happen. No. Um, Michigan just plays really, really well, and uh, they. I mean, look, they gagged this thing away too. Uh, Morgan with the the flub of the of the punt, they got yeah. lucky. The first pass of the game by McCarthy yeah. is picked, yeah. and, but he's uh, just out of bounds before he hadn't reestablished. Like they got lucky there. Yeah. Um, they had snap problem. They had everything, so it was a sloppy game for these two. But in the end, it was about who was going to make a play in overtime. How about the yeah. two semifinal teams that uh, muffed punts won the game? Yeah. Yes, they did. Yes, they All did. three phases. All three phases. Mm-hmm. Uh, good for that game, or we got more? Any more thoughts on that game? Hmm. Harbaugh declared J.J. McCarthy the greatest quarterback in the history of Michigan and college football. <laughs> not sure oh, like Tom Brady was there with his two million dollar watch. Get someone to love you as much as get someone yeah. to love you as much as Jim Harbaugh loves J.J. McCarthy. Seriously, I like, mean, like yeah, it is a no. flowing man crush of, of yeah, constant, it's a little weird. Like adulation. Yeah. Uh, he was. I will say this. He was not the best quarterback playing football today, so I'm no, not going with that. Far Michael from it. Probably Penix. a good, yeah, good segue into our yeah. the game Pat and I were at. Yeah, yeah. just an unbelievable. Um, uh, the guy the when they're when Michael Washington's Penix. humming. Yeah, I mean when Washington's humming with the deep kind of passes. The the I've said it on the pod before, and I tweeted it out, and the LSU fans come out of the the bayou at me and and got me pretty good. But, um, I mean, it really does remind me of the Burrow in 2019 when they're humming. I mean, they just didn't hum as consistently as that 2019 yeah. LSU team. But when they're on, it it's incredible. I think he had maybe eight, seven or eight completions today or tonight that were, uh, that were for 29 yards or more, I think, or something like that. I mean, it, it was unbelievable. At one point, he was averaging, like, he was 15 passes in, and he was averaging, like, 25 yards a completion. Uh, and he was just doing yeah. it all, too. It was like he, he was doing the crossing route, the little, the little swing pass where he does a side, like a, a side arm pass. Then he lays it up there with the, the deep heaves. And, and receivers are making great catches. It, yeah, it was a work of art. And to think that they almost lost the game, right? They came one pass away from losing the game is pretty wild. You could probably go back to the nine consecutive passes in the fourth quarter that Washington called. But as Ryan Grubb yeah. told me after the game, Michael freaking Penix, that's why we called those passes. So <laughs> it, uh, no, that would have been the greatest theft of a game in playoff history if, if Texas had won. They never led, and yet they had a chance to win at the very end, like on the last play. And, you know, three or four, whatever the number, passes into the end zone. It was just a crazy confluence of events between Washington not necessarily managing the clock, ideally, and then the weird, you know, injury. clock stoppage because of the injury. Oh. You know, Dylan Johnson, I, you know, Kalen DeBoer yeah. said, said, yeah, we're going to run it down to 15, 20 seconds left, you know, but the, the clock stopped because Dylan Johnson gets hurt. And that will be an injury to watch for next week, by the way, too, because he's very important to that offense. But, you know, one thing after another, and then they interfere with the fair catch on the punt, give them 15 free yards, give up a 40 yard pass. And all of a sudden it's like, oh, my God. Washington might lose a game that they have completely controlled. It was crazy. It was like that final drive. It was like, and I felt so bad for Dylan Johnson. Like, imagine you're going to lose the game because you got hurt and couldn't yeah. get off the field. Right. Like, right. what kind of a weird um, rule that is. Yeah. 
It um, is. I, I, I don't. I'd have to research the rule more to see whether it should be changed. But what a weird, weird rule. A guy gets hurt and almost costs him the shot in the national championship. But Texas ran nine plays in 45 seconds. Yeah. Like it was like every time they, I don't know, you were the drop back, throw a ball, no, three seconds off. I was like, oh, what's yeah. going on? Right. The clock like, how, wouldn't move. The clock would not. And they put move. a second back. Yeah. And they put a second yeah. back, which is, I think, accurate. Um, it was just, uh, just an unbelievable deal but washington was so much better of a team they had a real chance to put them away they didn't quite do it right you know when they they were they had a chance to get them down 13 and they couldn't pull it off they did they were kept going for it on fourths uh across the whole game but washington was the better team uh and and the right the right team won that defensive play on the last play by elijah jackson was like hang it in the hall of fame like how to how to pass breakup yeah right i mm-hmm. mean that was a like a dikembe matumbo swat at that ball yeah. to knock it out of there that was, remember that, that nfl really, i hate it you know remember that game richard sherman batted yes, that yes. one in the corner away like it was yep. just that perfect that's kind of what that was like this mm-hmm. is how you play defensive back yeah i, I had and no idea the, you know the go ahead well the i was gonna say the the uh Superdome press box uh, is so high up um, that, you know, it's hard to see things. But I was on the sideline during that, and I was on the opposite sideline. And uh, I didn't know how close it was until after the game I saw a replay. And I was like, wow, like it got incredibly close. And he, he te- the Texas receiver has his feet in, so he catches it like it's game. Um, yeah. And had no idea how close it was until after I followed my story and, and I saw the the uh, video right before leaving the press box. It was, that was wild. Yeah. That's, I mean, like Washington would, would never be, if you're a Washington fan, you would never be able to get over it. If you would have lost that game because you played so well, your team played fantastically, took the game by the throat right away, throw the long bomb to Jalen Polk, you know, get ahead, stay ahead. And then third quarter domination, total domination. But yeah, you, to Dan's point, you a couple times you don't get in the end zone, you kick field goals instead, and you just let Texas hang around a little bit, and then all of a sudden, three crazy things happen in a row, and boom, they're they're on the thirteen yard line. You're like, I, I would have just been absolutely nauseated if I were a Washington fan watching that last sequence. Well, I did. What? As a matter of fact, I, I will say. Um, I looked down like Dylan Johnson went into the injury tent and he came out and he was watching, you know, the defense out there and he was kind of like pacing around. And mm-hmm. I, I don't even want to think about how he must have felt watching. <laughs> there was broadcast of him leaving in a cart and cheering, like screaming in excitement. It was mm. a classic uh, the pain of victory. Yeah. Like he's overjoyed, but he's got his, you know, so it's going to be a big injury. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. Caitlin DeBoer after the game, just ice water. He's unbelievable. I mean, like, none of these guys really panic. Like, it's like Saban's out there getting all emotional, but he's like, it's more than this. And Harbaugh is just, Harbaugh is so, gets up there. I just want to wish everyone a happy new year. That's Weirdo. <laughs> Weirdo. Yeah. Okay. Harbaugh's on his own planet. <laughs> what? You know? Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Jim. Thank you. <laughs> happy New Year. Hey, Michigan coach just uh, wished me a happy new year. Feel good about that. <laughs> you know, the poor, uh, whoever's trying to interview him. Um, but Kaylin DeVore is just like, yeah, you know, we were just, I mean, this guy, NIA, NAIA, tough, man. You learn to coach at NAIA, nothing rattles you. Right. You're sitting there going, I hope the bus has got gas in it for the ride home. <laughs> mm-hmm. You don't got time to worry about anything. He, he was just like, yeah, we played pretty good, you know, whatever. It's nothing. No emotion. He, no, none. He was so matter of fact. And after yeah. the game ended, he's just like hanging out on the field for yeah. a half an hour, just talking to people, you know, just, I mean, just stoic. It's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. He's uh, like the classic upper Midwest guy that, that can't be bothered with getting too high or too low with his emotion. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And people were coming up to him like uh, on the field after the game, like, Hey, great win. Right. He's like, yeah, thanks. Yeah, right. I mean, just, what, what's going on here? Um, yeah. I, uh, by from, the way, Dylan our... Johnson, yeah. no, it's going to give the Dylan Johnson update. We, we, uh, to go back really quickly. Oh. Um, so I saw him in the, 
in the uh, locker room. And he, you know, I think Kalen DeBoer said this, but he, you know, re-aggravated uh, kind of like a foot ankle, right, right foot ankle uh, injury. And you could see in the locker room it was taped up. He walked off with a boot on on his right foot, no crutches or anything, you know. So yeah, it, it's something to watch uh, going forward yeah, for that's sure. Good. We hope he can play. Yeah, hope yeah. he can play. But from our standpoint, I, I I was a little bit perplexed and frustrated with Kalen DeBoer. Like I wanted something. <laughs> I wanted him mm. to to emote a little more. Give us Mm-mm. something to write yeah. here, man. This didn't We're, happen. Fascinating coaching matchup. DeBoer, obviously, you know Sioux Falls builds his way from Sioux Falls up. He's he's three seasons ago. He's the Indiana four seasons ago. He's the Indiana offensive coordinator. Yeah, uh, two years yeah. at Fresno, two years at Washington. Just out of nowhere. Uh, but he's got this learn to coach at at NAIA at Sioux Falls and won three titles. And you get Harbaugh, who's you know at this point like the first family of football. I mean, his brother's got the best team in the NFL, and he might have the best team in college football. Right. Um, it's crazy. Literally, a, you know, lifer. But he, too, built himself up. He started at South uh, at San Diego. So yeah. he's not, as he likes to say, you know, some people, what's his line? He gets third base, but they're not. Yes, or you know, whatever. <laughs> he couldn't even pull off that third baseline right. But no, that he could That couldn't. almost made it more, more, uh, more good. But yeah, these two like it's 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 interesting. But I don't think America knows who Kalen DeBoer is, and right. pretty much everybody knows who the Harbaugh's are. If you know anything mm-hmm. about, and you know, and you know, NFL quarterback for all these years, right? Saved by the Bell, he appeared. Uh, <laughs> Judge Judy fan, been, been Judge Judy's total whack job. All the different stuff. Kalen DeBoer's is quiet. They just yeah. win. I don't know that a lot of America really. I mean, they had a lot of big games this year, but I think this was the one that proved to the country that not only is this team re- for real, but this program is for real, and this coach absolutely, is for real. yeah. And that, you know, if I mean, if you want to go look at the recruiting rankings, they shouldn't be where they are, but they have put together a program and a team, and <clears throat> it's the third time in the last four games they've been an underdog, <clears throat> won them all, undefeated. They have won 10 straight games, all decided by 10 points or less. They've won five straight, decided by one score. So, you know, as crazy as the situation was that they ended up in at the end, they're used to being in these kind of tough, tough games, and they just believe they're going to win. They really do. Yeah, you know, it, it's interesting. The two teams that um, that lost uh, were the two teams with – as far as recruiting rankings go, certainly with more talent, right? Like uh, Texas and Alabama definitely had the uh, the talent edge when it comes to these recruiting rankings and star rankings and all that stuff. I think I saw somewhere, I don't remember, that Washington's was around the mid to high 20s as far as their like current roster like recruiting ranking. And I think Michigan's were in the mid-teens. I'll give it uh, to and you. I'm, it's I, the, the 24-7 yeah. sports does a team – talent composite hmm. of all of the players that are on the team and Alabama was number one and it was the highest they'd ever recorded hmm. uh, I think Ari Wasserman of the athletics says their their average player is a he's the 75th best recruit in the country was the number like a 75 recruit hmm. that's hmm. astounding amount of talent Texas yeah. was sixth uh, it went Alabama Georgia Ohio State Texas A&M Clemson I mean that's amazing you think about yeah. One guy got fired. Clemson had to fight with their <laughs> Tyler from Spartanburg. Yeah. <laughs> Ohio State's in disarray. Like, oof. Yeah. Yeah. Michigan was 14th. It went uh, Texas, then LSU, USC, Oklahoma, Oregon, Notre Dame, Miami, Penn State, then Michigan. And yeah, Washington was 26th. Mm. Zero five stars. Yeah. Michigan has two. Alabama had 18 five stars on the roster yesterday. Good glory. Um <laughs> what do you what is I mean this, forever you couldn't beat those top few teams, right? There's only a few teams right. could win the national title. Clearly this year you can. Now I'm not going to say Michigan isn't pretty strong. This is their third year in a row, but they don't have they they don't recruit at that level. Like 
what is 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 it just going to be a new era? We just in a new era that you can well, do it. A, a couple thoughts there. One, we're still in the pandemic extra year yep. era, and Washington has nine sixty-year seniors on their team. They yep. are a veteran, veteran, veteran team. And you know, when Kalen DeBoer got there, he, he's he's done phenomenal work, but but he did not inherit an untalented team. So they've got good players and they're old. Um, and so I think that's, that's part of what their sauce is now, Michigan. Yeah. That, I mean, now the funny thing is like the NFL is going to want plenty of Michigan's guys. They, they might not have all been five stars coming out of high school, but they're going to get right. drafted. They're going to mm -hmm. have a bunch of guys get drafted. Yeah. Each team kind of did it in a different way. I, you know, Pat talks about the veteranness of Washington. I, of course, I look at the quarterback position. Uh, like you just, you know, you got when you can land somebody like that, um, where at any point in the game, you're you're two plays away from 14 points. You know, with with Penix in the receivers, you're just uh, they score so quickly. Um, so that's like a game changer changer to me. Um, and then yeah, Michigan, uh, Michigan just feels like one of those programs that um it, it could do the the whole developmental thing in in just being so solid up front um and they they went up front you know um but it is we don't usually see uh two teams that are are more talented a lot more talented um both both you know lose those games so that was interesting to uh to watch yeah one thing i, I did want to point out real quick on the just the uh the washington texas game there was uh there was considerable amount of pregame discussion about washington's offensive line which won the joe moore award against texas's defensive line which is extremely good and you could kind of tell talking to both sides that they thought they were the better unit uh you know and texas was like yeah let's just get on the field and we're gonna see and guess what we saw zero sacks of michael Penix. Only three tackles for loss for Texas. And part of that, Penix is really good at just moving around the pocket. He avoids sacks and he gets rid of the ball quickly. But that also was a credit to the offensive line for for holding up really well against the uh, the Texas pass rush. Michigan is old. They are finished, managed. You know, I, I look at the kid that they got as their corner rotation defensive back late last transfer portal, Josh Wallace from UMass of all places. Hmm. And he played he had a couple solo tackles tonight. He's on the field. And obviously he's good enough. He was a lot better than, you know, UMass, but who knows what his his star ranking was probably a 2 or something, I don't know. Right. But he also played like 39 games at UMass. Like you just at some point you just have like experience. Mm -hmm. And then you play 13 more this year and you're just playing a lot of games. And you're older. And I agree. I think these COVID things are, are playing a role in it. Um, but get old, stay old is a huge thing in this sport because, um, I mean, literally until yesterday or today or whatever it was, you couldn't do this. This just didn't happen. Right. It was yeah. Alabama, Texas. It was Iles, it's Clemson against Alabama. Like you, the, 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 that second tier had no chance. And in this case, uh, they certainly did. And these weren't fluke victories. Like you said, they won the line of script. Washington won the line of scrimmage against Texas and mm -hmm. Michigan won the line of scrimmage against uh, Alabama. I mean, that's a little less of a shock, but definitely a different type of season than we have seen coming. And there will be a new national champion that we haven't had. Yeah. And no team from the South is going to play in the championship game for the first time since 2014 when it was Ohio State against Oregon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the first one, right? And mm -hmm. uh, eight straight where at least one SEC team was in the final. Yep. Four straight SEC championships. Just means more. Ross, defend your people. <laughs> <laughs> what is going oh, on? You you know that they were uh they were getting poised and ready to claim the Longhorns uh <laughs> if they were to beat the Huskies. Uh but alas they cannot. And now, yeah, you have Big Ten, Pac twelve or you might say Big Ten, Big Ten. Uh, mm -hmm. So now I'm sure if the Huskies win, you might have the other league claim uh, claim uh, a, a championship. Uh, 
so yeah, it's it's um you know we we look this year the SEC was down. I think we all knew we've talked about it on the pod quite a bit. You saw the uh, it was the worst non conference I think in six seven years in the league worst non conference uh, you know Power Five um, slate um, a record and uh, yeah they I think they finished at five and four maybe SEC in in bowl games I want to say um, but uh, yeah it's it's kind of shocking to uh, even though we kind of knew that it might be coming especially if Alabama beat Georgia. It was always more of a possibility that this uh, this might happen, and and uh, here we are. Yeah, I, I was posing this question um, in the press box as we were watching Alabama, Michigan. Who was more sick uh, today, Kirby Smart or Hugh Freeze? And mm. Hugh's at least off the hook because Alabama's not going to win the national title. Like they. they Giving up the fourth and 31 did not lead their arch rival to winning a national championship. It did get them in the playoffs. So probably Kirby is the more sick because they've got a clear Alabama problem and they're a really good team. I mean, they did win their bowl game 63 to three. Is that, that was that, that, that bowl game, <laughs> the depleted Knowles. <laughs> let's, we'll get, well, let's talk about that. Then we'll get to our prediction yeah. of the game. Yeah. Early prediction. So that was the game that everyone pointed to as like this is dust busted up. I mean, everybody from FSU stat out. Yeah. When when Rodemaker, the, the the second string quarterback who is now going to be the starter, just bailed. I think he was sitting in like bowl practices, going, "I'm going to get murdered." <laughs> hmm. I don't know. I don't want to say that why he quit because I don't know why he yeah. hit the transfer portal, but. That game got a lot of attention as a total, you know, this is, we need to fix this. And I, you know, I, I, you guys can have your opinion on this. Be interested to hear what you have to say. I, the, the, the default position in college athletics is we need to, we need a a rule that will fix. That's, that's how they, they approach. There's, we got, oh, come up with a rule and it'll fix things. I don't know how you fix this. I don't know that there's anything to fix. Uh, That game was a joke. There was a couple others, um, but to have like coaches and people go, a lot of media, oh, the bowl games don't mean as much. Well, you know why? In 1985, there are 18 bowl games. Right. In the mid 90s, there were 25. They're now 43 or something. 42. Of course, they don't mean those the games didn't exist. Do we, was every game a, an epic game back in the day? No. I I don't think there's a problem. I enjoyed bowl season i thought even the new year's six games and obviously all of this is getting changed next year anyway but like missouri beating ohio state was fascinating and meaningful on both sides to those of us who love college football um you know a game like that meant something because ohio state didn't have anything and was it a classic best on best no it's just different i just i just I don't get it. I get I get there's this whole bit where you just gotta be like, get off my lawn and it was not as good as the old days, but I, I, I liked it. I liked it. Yeah, well specific to the Orange Bowl, it is that we have a fix coming next year. It's called the twelve yeah. team playoff. Mm-hmm. That was that was that game was the single best endorsement of the twelve team playoff you could possibly have because A, Georgia would be in, and B Florida State would be in and their players would presumably play. And so you would actually have two quality teams in the field, competitive, whether you know they're not, they wouldn't play each other right away. But you know, you you you're just gonna have fewer teams that are that are gonna mail in the bowl game when when you have twelve teams in the playoffs. So it's getting it's gonna fix itself. That's why we if we had had the playoff this year, if we'd had twelve teams this year, it would have been fixed. And we could have and should have. But so no, I'm not sitting here, you know, hand wringing over that very much because help is on the way. Well, I mean, the I say easy fix, it's not really easy, uh, because it involves skirting NCA rules, um, <laughs> but is building into contracts nil contracts or whatnot that uh you got to play in the bowl game and here's your money to do it uh or it's the whether it's come from the 
whether that comes from the school, NIL collective, whatever, or maybe the bowl itself, which right now, again, is illegal kind of. But Nick, Nick Caparelli last year from bowl season, like last December, um, mentioned to me that uh, that was something that they he thinks the NCAA should should reconsider the – the rule um, around bowls not being able, because right now it's against NCAA rule for bowls to provide NIL to athletes to uh, endorse the game you know, or endorse any event in general, um, postseason basketball or uh, preseason kind of pre-conference basketball tournaments are also included in that. So there are other ways to do it. Uh, but it's certainly a conversation piece where you incentivize players to to maybe I just, play. I don't know there's enough money to do it. Yeah. I mean, if you're preparing for well, the yeah, NFL, bowl, yeah, bowl cares? people, well, bowl people have said it's not really worth them probably doing. Like it doesn't, it doesn't change viewership to the point where right. they need to do that. You know, the ratings are good. Uh, the games are good. Just let football be played. Uh, they never trust football. They always trust legislation. <laughs> um, I don't know. I just don't see it. I just, I'm not, yeah, mm-hmm. there's some clunkers and yeah, that was ridiculous. But like you said, that gets solved the playoff. Are there some games that aren't going to be good? Um, just hating on, you know, the cheese at bowls or the pop tart bowls. They're, they're finding ways. Uh, it's if two teams want to play football, I just don't, I saw a lot of enthusiasm in bowl season. I, I think there's a disconnect between the people who are talking about college football and the people complaining about the bowls and the people that really watch college football. Hmm. Yeah. Well, I think and there are tiers here, right? Like, well, first of all, you have the tier of the expanded playoff. You have that group of bowls where you shouldn't have many, if not, you know, any opt outs at all. But then you have like the next tier is the real worry, right? It's those, right. it's those schools that barely miss the uh the expanded playoff um in and it's going to be bowls like the gator bowl the the holiday bowl the music city bowl and and so those bowls are going to kind of turn into what we saw the orange bowl where it's just like this is an opportunity for a lot of backups to get time show themselves prove themselves and it's kind of exhibition in nature. But then below those bowls is like another tier where you shouldn't have a whole lot of opt-outs. You've kind of got a lot of the group of five and bottom type power five, some that might be making a first bowl in years, you know, and people want to play in it. So you're talking about a, I don't know, four to six, maybe six to eight at most group of group of bowls there that 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 come right after the the playoff expansion we just all have to kind of realize that bowls are kind of what they always have been outside of the top two or three bowls that decided the national championship back in the day they're kind of exhibitions to have practice more practice days for coaches and players to prepare for next season yeah go have fun uh speaking of fun espn tonight had a uh bourbon street (laughs) b-roll Ah, uh, yeah. They had a camera Oops. walking down Bourbon Street, broadcast out live to 20-something million or whatever we're watching. And uh, as is the want, as happens on Bourbon Street, there was a flashing. A stray nipple. A nipple was seen <laughs> on a... Or as Elaine would say, a nipple, a nip. A nip slip. It was not a slip. <laughs> It was purposeful. No. Will America survive, Pat Forty? No, as a matter of fact, we're 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 shutting down. <laughs> we are shutting down because there was a nip slip on uh, on Bourbon Street. I mean, look, you take a camera down Bourbon Street, you take your chances, right? <laughs> Lucky yeah. that but was you can all be it seen. Was. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> I only got one worse. nipple, not two. <laughs> I have seen. I think some it was only one. on Bourbon Street. I think it was, yeah. Uh, it was just a one. I but have, there was a I child have... in a stroller next to the <laughs> That's Louisiana. the funniest part. If you watch yeah. this thing. Also and very I Bourbon had, Street. For the purposes yeah. of podcast host, I had to watch this many times. That was the only reason I watched this. <laughs> oh, please. Of course. There is a child in a stroller right next to the exposed. <laughs> Go ahead, Pat. Uh, no. Uh, 
again, I, I have seen <laughs> much more graphic things on Bourbon Street. Time to but. track her down and get some comments yep. on having yep. uh, your nip like Elaine shown to all of your friends and family. <laughs> 20 million yeah. people. Yeah, right. <laughs> There's like a legendary story of a uh, of a TCU fan who was jumping up and down at a game at the AT&T Stadium. Hmm right as the camera we don't know whether this is true because nobody has footage of it but uh they've told this story and she's jumping up and down in excitement and her top kind of slips and right as the at&t scoreboard which is 80 yards long <laughs> yeah <laughs> I mean, it's the biggest scoreboard <laughs> on earth the video is board. broadcaster yeah. it is a half second thing nobody apparently have video but it would be the largest nip slip of all times. <laughs> uh, kind of a great uh, honor to have. Maybe, I don't know if you, you want know. video proof or not. Sure. All right, let's get to this because we're at 439 and the reason is because the sunset. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm serious about this. This is insulting to the fans. There were a lot of people that were not able to watch the end of the Washington Texas game because the game kicked off after nine o'clock. It ended at what? Almost one Eastern time. It ended at, uh, yeah, 12.50. I have no idea what time it ended. 12.50 Eastern time. Yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah. 12.50. Uh, people have to work. It's the first day of work. January 2nd. Your boss is all bright eyed, bushy tailed down there ready for a TPC <laughs> report to get filed, right? Yep. And college football is playing games in the middle of the night. Why? Because the arrogance of the Rose Bowl. We make fun of this 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 uh, sunset, but this is why. Like it screwed people. Yes. Like the, they have to have the sun set at the end of the third quarter. The sun is going to set at the time it's going to set. They could move it up and have it set at the end of the first quarter. It's still a beautiful sunset. The sun is not going anywhere, hopefully. The San Gabriel Mountains are not going anywhere. <laughs> we, got, we got a lot of problems if the sun, you know, yeah. is going somewhere. I'll be I'll be well, bring back the if sun. It is, yeah. Yeah. The podcast is going somewhere too. If the away, sun doesn't right. rise That's, today. Yeah. yeah. Move the thing up. But the Rose Bowl won't do it because they want to start at 510 Eastern. And the arrogance of the Rose Bowl. And the arrogance of the commissioners and these ADs and the college football playoff people and everyone else in this sport that won't stand up to the Rose Bowl and say, sorry, buddy, we're kicking it at three or you ain't in. Mm -hmm. Because we have all of these fans. Millions and millions of fans that want to watch. We, 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 we spend our year with this sport. We spend our money with this sport. We give it the attention, the whole thing. A lot of people are making millions and millions of dollars off all these fans. And you sit there and say, yeah, you're you you kind of can't. We're going to set it up to make it almost impossible for you to watch the the, the set one of the semifinal games. Yes, they could do it, but it's not it shouldn't have to be that choice. Conference championship Sunday in the National Football League, AFC, NFC championship. The first game kicks at three. The second game kicks at six thirty. Obviously, if there's a triple overtime or whatever you got to do, you move it back a little bit. 510 is ridiculous, and it is it is a testament to the lack of leadership, the lack of courage, the lack of everything in this sport that a lot of people listen to this podcast and get to watch an unbelievable football game in their favorite sport because they had to work. Soapbox. Close. No, I, you know what? Well said, and I echo everything that you have said, and that's what this is. Here's the thing. Gosh, we've talked about this plenty of times, but college fans, college football fans' willingness to put up with being treated like crap bites them in the ass. You know what? And I, I mean, I don't blame the fans, but they have been played for suckers for decades. We're going to kick off at 11 on a 100-degree day in September because TV says so. We're going to kick off at 9.30 at night on a Thursday or a Monday or whatever because TV says so. We're going to, you know, we're not going to announce kickoff times until six days ahead of time. And it doesn't matter if your plans to travel to a game work around that or not because TV says so. 
And that's just the way the, the fans get used and abused, but they put up with it. And so it's just going to keep happening this way. But it, it is a complete um, miscarriage, really, to, to, to have games, big games, games people care about immensely ending at one in the morning. Yeah, it's it's kind of time for college football to break out of uh, this like long standing uh, acquiescing to to TV in in you know this like amateur type of we're the little guy and we just have to kind of be be bossed around pushed around a little bit like college football in the last I think three years has proven TV viewership wise is the number two sport in the country and it's kind of time to start start acting like it um and that means kind of putting the foot down with stuff like this uh you know in another option to this today honestly would have been to kick off the sugar bowl at 1 30 p.m if if they weren't going to move it yeah i mean it's new year's day people are on the couch watching tv like have the uh, have the citrus bowl at night or something, but like put the playoffs in, you know, where people can, can watch them. But, I mean, I, I, it's unbelievable. You want young people to watch. I mean, kids got to go back to school. They got this, you got that. Like, and I know, you know why, I mean, it's not as big of a deal on the West coast, but there's a lot of people <laughs> biggest time zones, the Eastern time zone. And yeah. uh, I feel bad. People watch the whole year. And this is one of the three most important games of the year. And they make it impossible. And their reason when you ask them is, well, we can't tell the Rose Bowl what to do. <laughs> what in the living? What? The guys can't even imagine any other business run this way. And you, us three and Sean, we, this is our jobs. We can stay up till 445 and do a podcast. Yeah. We don't have to punch a clock tomorrow at 8 a.m. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So no, it's yeah, not but- that big of a deal for us. But. Right. But that yeah. Yeah. <laughs> If, well, yeah, I got a flight at seven thirty. <laughs> but okay. um, no, but like, if, yeah, if if you're a school bus driver and you got to be on the route at seven a.m. tomorrow, you can't stay up and watch this stuff. I mean, it it, it is it it is a ridiculous uh, hardship that they put on fans because they can. It's a joke. The, the 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 sunset's a funny joke. But they next time this comes up, they need to put those semifinals three o'clock, six forty five. College game's a little bit longer. That's it. That's your semifinals on New Year's Day. Enough with this middle of the night stuff. If it's New Year's Eve, maybe it's a little different. But um, for New Year's Day, this is this is this is embarrassing. It's embarrassing, and I, no one's got a good answer for it. Well, right. and you know, with this expanded playoff, we're gonna have all kind of crazy times. Right. right. Oh, the the first, yeah, you do, like brace yourselves because they're gonna be scheduling around the NFL. Um, there's going to be probably a Thursday night first round game. You know, I mean, it just it, the you know uh, it, this is man. probably not going to get any good, any better anytime soon. All I ask is they care about the fans a little bit. Think about the fans. Um, all right, finally, quick look at look ahead. One week, Washington, Michigan. I think Michigan is opened as a four and a half point favorite. Obviously, the the Dylan Johnson news will be very interesting and any other injuries that come out of there. Clash of styles. Quick thoughts, Pat. Um, I picked Washington over Michigan to win the championship back when the selection Sunday came out. So I'm sticking with that. I will keep riding with the Huskies. Uh it's going to be tough, though, because, yes, if Dylan Johnson's out, the running game is compromised, and I do think Michigan can really cover. But you can be able to really cover, and those receivers are going to still make plays downfield. I mean, uh, Jeff Schwartz, who does a fair amount of commentary, said that 50-50 balls for Washington receivers are more like 95-5 balls because they just win those those battles so routinely. So I'm riding that. with the – yeah. Riding with the the best quarterback and the best receivers, and see if they can uh, light it up again through the air against the against the Wolverines. Yeah, I'm uh, fascinated by um, by this matchup uh, in completely drastically different styles of football. We talked a lot about the lines and the building of the 
of the Lions of of Michigan um, in in just like the running game and the short passing game and all that stuff, high percentage throws and all that. And then Washington, it's like kind of the opposite. It's just like we're gonna we're we're deep even this thing, um, and and we're gonna go for it, right? And um, it, it's uh, I, I'm I'm I love the contrasting styles of this thing. Um, and there's, you know, there's some other kind of like off the field type of things that are, are really fascinating. You know, obviously these two schools will be conference mates next year. And I think Washington's hosting Michigan next season yeah. uh, to open like the big October 10. or something. Yeah. Yeah. So Michigan's it's hosting um, Texas too. Yeah. There yeah. You go. It's, gonna be yeah wild, it's wild. Yeah. So it's, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, pumped to see this one and it's going to uh, be great. pumped to see two different uh two different styles kind of clash on the field there yeah it'll be very very uh interesting michigan is so hard to beat and at the same time i think the reason i picked washington to beat texas i was like yeah michael Penix will figure it out uh and he sure did so um i don't know i won't make a pick now i'll let this play out a little bit but uh it's uh, it's going to be a good one. So we will have a show later this week uh, previewing all that and talking about everything else. We appreciate everyone listening. Thanks for, uh, you know, our audience is what motivates us to do things in the middle of the night. We want you guys all set up. And uh, special thank you to Sean Anderson, our producer extraordinaire, who's uh, getting, hope we got the coffee on. Yeah, Tough. he's got a got a, some hours of work here to do yeah. to get this ready for everybody bright and early when they wake up tough one so all right we appreciate you continue to subscribe share us on social media tell your friends about us we will talk to you later